Good morning, everyone. Our scripture reading is taken from two of Paul's letters, Romans chapter 7, verse 13 through chapter 8, verse 2, and Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For I... Do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law, waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, Who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep from doing the things you want to do. This is God's Word. Well, today we are going to take a look at the second half of Romans 7 and then on into a little bit of 8 and then into the book of Galatians. And as I said last week, Romans 7 is a complicated part of Paul's letter. And it's difficult for two reasons. It is difficult to understand what Paul is saying. In fact, Romans 7, 13 through 25 is one of the most debated sections in Paul's writings. Hardly any two commentators agree on precisely what he means. And so we're certainly not going to settle that today, all right? The two major interpretive decisions that you need to make are, one, is Paul talking as a Christian or is Paul remembering his past before he was a Christian? Commentators don't agree. I can guarantee you that the study Bibles that are out there, the notes you have, they don't agree on it. Some of you have already been scouring your notes. What does my study Bible say? This is what I've landed on. I've landed on this, that Paul is talking about his experience before Christ. And I'll give you some context for that as we move along. So, Paul is difficult to understand, but I think the gist of what he is saying is remembering back to what it was like before he was a Christian. The second reason that Romans 7 is difficult to understand is that the Christian life is difficult to understand. If you really think about it, you have questions about the nature of your Christian walk. There is a swirl in the Christian community about the nature of the Christian life. Is it perfectionism? In other words, does there come a point in time when we cross over in our Christian walk and we finally don't sin any longer? And that, of course, is countered by another swirl of teaching on pessimism. 
It's almost a defeatism, a defeatism in the Christian life that says, man, I just keep going through the same cycle of sins. There is no victory for me. The questions that we need to ask today of the text about the nature of the Christian life are these. Should we expect the Christian life to be characterized by the sort of severe struggle that Paul describes here in Romans 7? Or is this struggle one from which the Christian has been rescued by Christ? Again, what is the nature of the Christian life? Is it hopeless? Is it perfect? Well, I would like to conclude at least this way. It is hopeful. The Christian life is hopeful. And the way I know that is from reading Paul's letters over and over again. The more I read and the more you read, you will discover that he does not teach a perfectionism, but neither does he teach a pessimism. He teaches a hopefulness because we are in Christ. And so today what I want to do is ask the question, what does the normal Christian life look like? Three answers. Number one, it remembers life before Christ. The normal Christian life remembers what it was like before we were in Christ and forgiven by him. The Apostle Paul does this a lot. Let me just show you one example. If you have a Bible or a way of getting here, go over to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 11 Paul remembers what his former life was like. For I would have you know, brothers, he says, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Verse 13, if you're just getting there. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Well, stop. Now, Paul mixes some ideas there, but I think you get the gist. He is not afraid to remember what his life was like before Christianity. He is doing the same thing here in Romans 7. In verse 15, when he says, For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. This is Paul remembering his past. And it's fascinating because as you look into Scripture and understand Paul's past, you understand that he has some very good things to say about himself. But he doesn't pride himself on those things for salvation. And he has some very bad things to say about himself. But he doesn't let those bad things sink him into the despair that Christ has forgotten him. Paul is a fascinating figure in Scripture to study, particularly when he talks like you and I sometimes talk. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. This is a famous passage in Romans. In summary, Paul is saying, the things I want to do, I don't. And the things I don't want, I do. He's talking about sin. And notice the comprehensive way he talks about sin. Sin has two parts. It's not doing what God says to do, and it is doing what God says don't do. So if you can imagine for a moment, Paul sitting here and writing Romans 7, he's already had in his mind the Ten Commandments, as we know from earlier verses in Romans 7, verse 7 and following, he talks about covetousness, which is commandment number 10. So Paul is thinking through the Ten Commandments, and now I'm imagining for Paul, he's sitting there, and as he comes across the Ten Commandments, he remembers something very positive that God says. Honor your father and mother. And Paul would have occasion to remember all the times that he didn't. And then Paul would come across a negative command from God. God says, don't steal. And Paul would remember that time when he was 12 years old, and he did. <laughs> 
And this kind of conflicted behavior has confused Paul. This is why he said, I do not understand my own actions. I don't understand myself. I am unable to stop myself from reaching out to sin. But then when something good is in front of me, I turn away from it. That's what Paul is saying. Most people can relate to Paul as he describes this nagging failure in his life. He gets his wires crossed. His time before Christ was confusing to him. And I think what has happened is many Christians have come to expect this sort of severe struggle with sin to characterize their own Christian life. And this is a typical understanding of the Christian life, that we just have to live with a nagging feeling of hopelessness in the face of sin. And that's how I'm defining it. Maybe even despair. Look at Paul's words in verse 24. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of death? There is a hopelessness here. I don't think hopelessness fits the context of the Christian life. Now, as I said again, there's an interpretive decision to make. Is Paul talking about the situation of a Christian who has been rescued by Christ? Or is Paul talking about the situation of a non-Christian who is still under the law, apart from Christ, and perhaps even trying to still earn righteousness by works? I think it's the latter. And let me give you some context here. I think context helps us best understand what Paul is saying. You do know that the chapter and verse divisions that we have in our English Bibles are a later invention, right? They're not inspired by God. They help with referencing Scripture, but sometimes they can get in the way and keep us from understanding what Scripture is really saying. So context saves us here. Let me just give you some context. Look at chapter 6, verses 17 and 18. Paul writes, But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and that means to which you were handed over to, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. There has been a transformation in the life of the Christian, an objective positional change from disobedience to obedience. The same thought is echoed in verse 22. But this is uh, chapter 6, verse 22. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God... On and on it goes. Paul is saying in these verses that you used to be slaves of sin, but you have been set free. And this is the mark of Christianity. Now contrast that with what we read in chapter 7. But I am of the, this is verse 14, chapter 7, verse 14, Romans. Paul wrote, but I am of the flesh sold under sin. How does being free fit with not being free? Which is it? Here's another example. Look at chapter 8, verse 2. This is a verse that is in your worship guide. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Again, Christians are free. This is another mark of Christianity. But contrast that with chapter 7, verse 23. But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin. How does being free fit with being captive? It doesn't. Now, if you're looking at your study Bible note, you may be reading examples of why they're trying to prove the opposite point. Let me give you some of those. What about the remarks about the law, the positive remarks about the law that Paul makes? In verse 14, he says, for we know that the law is spiritual. And in verse 22, he says, for I delight in the law of God. 
The question here is, is it possible for a non-Christian to delight in the law of God? And I would say, from what Paul says later on, absolutely. Again, I don't normally do this, but we're flipping around a little bit today. If you go to Romans chapter 10, just a few chapters beyond where we are now, in Romans chapter 10, Paul, Paul's heart goes out to his brother and sister Israelites who do not yet have a saving relationship with God. Listen to how they're described. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. They probably say things like, I delight in the law of God. I delight to do good things. My path in life is smoother for it. But it doesn't mean that they have surrendered their lives to Christ. That's Paul's point in Romans chapter 10. Let me try to bring this home a little bit with some application. And I'm thinking um, for a moment about our students and our younger, our younger children I know your families. Um, Lori and I have been at Bethesda here for almost 24, 25 years now. So I've had an opportunity to talk to your parents a lot about your lives. And one encouraging thing that I've noted in talking with you, with them, is that your mom and dad are thankful for the way that you obey their laws. You know, like... Don't hit your brother in the face before 9 o'clock in the morning. Don't disrupt the family schedule before we get off to school. Those kinds of rules. They're thankful that you don't do those kinds of things. That is good obedience to your parents. Your life goes smoother for it. But I also know from talking with your parents that they understand that's not salvation. You may delight in their laws, but not yet trust Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And if you're thinking now as a student that maybe I can continue on this road of trusting the law and obeying and everything's going to go okay for me, Paul has told us over and over again it won't. You need Christ in the end. Obedience is a good thing, but it doesn't save us. Christ's obedience alone saves us. And so for everyone else here, it's just a reminder. Should we follow the law of God in the forms that we can understand it as wisdom and pointing to Christ? Absolutely. But even our good obedience must be repented from at times when we're trusting it for salvation rather than trusting in Christ for the forgiveness of our sins. I think Paul is remembering his past. Remembering our past without Christ gives rise to greater praise for his deliverance from sin. It lets our joy go deeper as we remember his sacrifice. Remembering his past helps Paul remember God's mercy and forgiveness. And at the same time, Christ's unswerving loyalty to Paul that despite his sin, despite his following the law for salvation, that Christ is willing to come along and save him. From time to time, it's helpful for us to remember what our lives were like before Christ. That is why we include a confession section in our, in our worship guide. We have to confess sin now in our Christian walk, but every once in a while while you're reading along, isn't your conscience pricked about what it was like before you became a Christian and the hopelessness that you felt? I think that's the normal Christian life. Occasionally remember what it was like before Christ. After all, it is our past, and it's a past that God has saved us from. Number two, what is the normal Christian life? It remembers in the conflict with sin, the Christian is never alone. 
We do have, as Christians, an ongoing struggle. Paul writes over and over again to the churches that he's planted or that he has overseen. And what does he write about? He writes about their sin. We say, wait a minute. I thought you said Romans 7 is not about the Christian struggle with sin. Don't think Romans 7 is about the Christian struggle with sin. But if you do think Galatians 5, verses 16 and 17 is about the Christian's struggle with sin. Paul is able to both, in his Christian life, remember the past forgiveness of sin and the present struggle with sin. Romans' language sometimes is helpful to help us convey the feelings, I don't understand what's going on inside me, why do I do what I don't want to do, why don't I do what I should do, that is helpful language at times. But I do think saying wretched man or wretched woman that I am is beyond the pale. It is hopeless language. I think that's what Paul is trying to get across. The struggle with sin is not meant to be hopeless. It doesn't mean we won't still sin that there isn't a struggle. And that's why I think Paul addresses it in Galatians chapter 5. Again, let me read those verses. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep us from doing the things you want to do. What is the difference between Romans and Galatians. And the reason I put them here in the worship guide as I did is so that you could see the difference between Romans 7 and Galatians chapter 5. What is the difference? The difference is the absence of the Spirit. In Romans 7, there is no talk of the Spirit. You don't get there till Romans 8. In Galatians 5, there is talk of the Spirit. The Spirit's presence is our help in our struggle with sin. We do not go through this struggle alone. A normal part of the Christian life is remembering that in our conflict with sin, we have not been left to our own resources. We have the Spirit. So I was thinking, how do I illustrate this? And I was thinking back to my high school biology days. So I liked biology, but I did not have a knack for dissection. So the time that frog was laid out in front of me and I took that scalpel, the only thing that I was able to do was slice that thing down the belly and lay her open. That was it. I looked at those organs. They confused me. I didn't have an eye for them. What is going on? And suddenly, Lisa, my lab partner, grabbed that scalpel from me and said, oh, let me help. And she just started to poke and point out all those different organs. I kept saying, how did you match that with the picture in the book? I can't see it. Lisa had an eye for it. She could see it. She knew what was wrong or what was right. I was amazed. This is the kind of help that Paul is talking about that comes from the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is able to point out to us those things that we may not understand and call them what they are. This is what happens in Galatians chapter five once again. The Spirit of God calls these things out for the Christian. He calls out the desires of the flesh. The works of the flesh, he says, they're evident. Like Lisa said, The heart is evident. It's right there. Or the kidneys are evident. They're right there. The works of the flesh are evident. They they don't leave us guessing. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and and things like these. These are the things that Christians struggle with. But the very first Part of the battle in our struggle is to identify these things as sin. Once you know they're wrong, the Spirit of God begins to massage them out of us, if you will. And on the flip side, the Spirit of God comes along and says, these are the things that are right. Right? 
Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. These are the things that he begins to massage into our hearts. The struggle with sin is real, but we are not left alone in it. As we submit ourselves to the Spirit, the Spirit works through his words so the deeds of the flesh are crucial so that we know that the Spirit is not leaving us guessing, and the fruit of the Spirit is crucial, so we know how we should be following God. This is a mysterious process. It is one that is done and done only with the Spirit's help. So these are two marks of the normal Christian life. You remember your past, and you know in your struggle with sin you're not alone. The third one, though, I think, helps us understand these first two. And the third mark of the natural, normal Christian life is that we must remember there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In the ancient world, when you committed a crime, you were given a penalty, and it was called a condemnation. Condemnations varied depending on the crime. Find a sum of money, or imprisoned, or exiled, or even executed in some cases. Whatever the crime, there was a condemnation for it. Did you notice all those penalties have something in common? They all speak of loss. If you're fined a sum of money, you lose part of your wealth. If you are given over to the jailer to be imprisoned, you lose some of your freedom. If you are exiled to an island, you lose companionship. Worst, if you are handed over to the executioner, you lose your life. Paul is saying, before the Christian life, there was only condemnation and loss. There was an estrangement from God that every person would experience for eternity. A sense of loss, of guilt, of shame. Why? Because our crimes deserved it. Because the crime of our sins must be paid for. We stood condemned and hopeless before Christ. And as we've heard, the normal part of the normal Christian life is to remember this former condemnation apart from Christ. And part of the Christian life is to feel the struggle with sin. But here in this third point, Paul is saying a necessary part of normal Christian living is to be certain that there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. No more will condemnation of any kind be a threat to the Christian. And when you learn that, it changes everything. How so? Well, you may lose earthly wealth, but it is not a sign of condemnation. You may have been in jail or lose personal freedom some other way. It is not a sign of condemnation. You may lose friends or want friends or companionship, but not have it. But in Christ, it is not a sign of condemnation. You may lose your life, but those in Christ Jesus are not condemned. In Christ, we have eternal riches, eternal freedom, eternal companionship, eternal life, which has started now. There is an assurance, a hopefulness in the Christian walk that though we struggle and sometimes fail in our sin, we should not be pessimistic. We should not be defeated. We should use, as I said last week, the tools that God has given us, repentance, trust, faith in him. How can this hopefulness come to us? It comes to us in Christ. Paul writes elsewhere, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor so that you by his poverty might become rich. Christ confined himself to this world so that we might experience the next. On the cross he lost the deepest form 
form of companionship with his father when he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He did that for us. And the cross is the final word of God's condemnation so that normal Christian living is now knowing the assurance of Christ's benefits apply to us. You know what it comes down to? It comes down to, do you really trust God? Do you feel safe in him, in Christ? If you don't, you don't want to think about your former life before Christ because you're still in it and you're still trying to work your way to God. If you do, you know that that former way of life has been forgiven and forgotten. If you are not assured of safety in God, you won't fight that struggle with sin because every time sin rages its head up, you just feel so intimidated by it and you remember back to your past failings rather than the times that Christ has forgiven you. If you aren't assured that Christ, that you're safe in him, you're just not going to live this kind of life that we sang about earlier or that we all hope for or want. We're certainly not going to be able to go out in assurance and show other people what the gospel is truly like. There is now, Paul writes, therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And we are convinced of this by the Spirit of God. For the law of the Spirit of life, Paul writes in Romans 8, 2, has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. We're going to have the opportunity over these next several weeks to enjoy teaching on the Spirit of God. To enjoy the Spirit of God, I should say. You may not enjoy the teaching, but enjoy the Spirit of God. That's what Romans 8 is teaching. So let me conclude this way. I have learned most about the Spirit from a man named J.I. Packer. I started reading Packer back in college. The first book I read by him, Knowing God, it's, I know it's an old book, and a lot of you who are younger think there really can't be any wisdom in anything that's old. But it's a great book. I highly recommend Knowing God. If, if not for the preface alone, for the first sentence, as Packer writes, as clowns yearn to play Hamlet, so I have longed to write a treatise on God. How can you not want to read a guy who wrote that line? He's got a chapter in, about the Spirit of God, but then Packer wrote another book called Keep in Step with the Spirit. And in that book, this is what he writes, and this is what we're looking forward to in the next few weeks. The Holy Spirit of God is a comforter, counselor, helper, strengthener, and supporter. Had he ceased to do these things, the church would long ago have perished, for there would have been no Christians to compose it. The Christian's life in all its aspects, intellectual and ethical, devotional and relational, upsurging in worship and outgoing in witness is supernatural. Only the Spirit can initiate and sustain it. So apart from Him, not only will there be no lively Christians in congregations, there will be no Christians and no congregations at all. But in fact, the church continues to live and grow for the Spirit's ministry has not failed nor ever will. And that's where we're headed. We may still sin, but Christ offers complete forgiveness. He wants us to feel safe in his presence. He wants that to inspire our praise and our prayer, our personal relationships, how we deal with our property, where we spend our money, where we spend our time, where we travel, all of that, all of that as we rest safely in him. I could just keep going on and on and on. That's a terrible way to end a sermon, so sorry. But let's trust Christ um, for his goodness and the spirit. And let's, uh, let's pray.
Father, we're thankful for the assurance that you give us in your word. So make it alive to us by your spirit. Teach us, instruct us. Where we still struggle to understand difficult parts of your word, may that create in us trust in you and, and peace. Uh, may it create humility in us as we have discussions after sermons about intended meaning. Father, we're just thankful for our salvation and uh, the way you have blessed us richly here at Bethesda um, to be able to speak your word, to sing your praises, to fellowship with each other, um, just a taste of what is coming. We're grateful for it. And so we ask um, that you would continue to bless our, our very small efforts here. In Christ's name, amen.